today we're going to be doing some watercolor. Um, if you haven't checked it out yet, I have a series over on the blog called Watercolor Basics, where I sort of walk you through some of the things that I do. So, um, you know, this is part of that, and I would really love it if you guys took a moment after this video and went and checked that out. There's all sorts of good stuff up there. So, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be doing color blooms, and for that, I'm using Winsor and Newton. 140 pound cold press watercolor paper. I'm using a spray bottle full of clean water. My Winsor Newton whole bin uh, Daniel Smith pan. Some of these are self filled. Some of these I order, you know, pre pre done because I like how the colors look in pan versus from tube. Two cups of water off screen. A small a uh, palette with wells in it, a variety of brushes, and some paper towels. So the first thing I need to do is I need to erase the line art from this illustration of Kara from my comic, Seven Inch Kara, and she's um, surrounded by echinacea. You guys might also know them as cone flowers. They um, are sort of like a garden flower here in Nashville. I didn't really see them a whole lot in Louisiana, but I like them. I think they look pretty interesting. They're like daisies, but with like this big cone thing, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and erase this. This was inked with the waterproof, the Copic Proof Sailor Mitsuo Ida brush pen. It is a double-sided brush pen, and I have tutorials on inking with this over here, so I don't think we need to go over that. So I'll check in with you guys after I've erased this. All right, so since we've got the pencil mostly erased, I'm gonna go ahead and free this from its spiral binding. I find it kind of hard to work with these sort of little illustrations when they're still attached. Of course, I also find it kind of hard to work when there's a cat in my lap, and there's a cat in my lap right now. He thinks me recording is time for him to get his cuddles on. Except he's big and it's hard to work around him, so maybe I can persuade him to go elsewhere. We've got our little illustration. And the next thing I'm going to want to do, because I'm going to be putting a lot of water on this, is I want to tape it down. You know what? Actually, I have a better idea. I'm going to go scan this so you guys will have access to it. See you guys in a minute. Okay, so this image is now available in my Gumroad shop. You guys can find the link to that in the description below and uh, probably in the annotation right here. Now I'm going to tape this down. I really kind of want to do it as minimally as possible because I don't want this buckling. Like I said, I'm going to be applying a lot of water to this. So if you're doing this at home, you want to do this on a paper that can handle a lot of water. So arches, um, I recommend a mold made over a handmade unless you're doing, I don't know, something you're drawing on the paper. I find that mold made tends to work better for illustrations where, small illustrations where you want tight details, whereas handmade tends to work well for larger illustrations where you have the room to sort of let the paper surface do what it's going to do. and I'm just using regular white masking tape. I try to always have some of this on hand. It's great for smaller, or smaller illustrations like this. Okay, so first thing we wanna do is we wanna get that initial layer in there. So I need to decide on a background color and I think I want something um, kind of purple. So I am going to, I'm gonna mix it in a well just because my tray over here is kind of contaminated. I know I need to clean it. Um, I just really haven't had the time. I'm gonna start with a very light wash and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna there we go. Already wet some of the paper. Might be time for a new spray bottle. And then apply my wash. And I know this seems dark. Just remember um, your 
watercolors are going to dry lighter than they go down. Now you can also use a clean paper towel while the paper is wet. There they are. And dab up some of this if you want, uh, you know, to push even more light play. find that for little, little illustrations or even comic pages, what really helps um, push interest, make something interesting and dynamic is a lot of bouncy contrast. So introducing that at kind of an early stage will definitely help make that an easier goal to accomplish. And then I'm also going to just go ahead and dab in a few darker areas. Just like I said, to help with that sort of bouncy contrast. And since the paper's wet, it will absorb it um, and it's not going to be quite as harsh. Of course, if you want something more dramatic at this stage, you can go straight to your palette, especially if you, your paints have been activated. And you can do that just by spritzing some of the water from your spray bottle onto your paints. So, I'm going to allow this to dry. But first, I'm gonna go in, kind of wadding up my paper towel and pick up on the leaf, on the petals, some of the pigment in pursuit of that bouncy contrast. And I want it to mostly be the petals that would be towards the viewer. Okay, so I'm gonna let this dry and then I'll check in with you guys. All right, so my paper is still slightly damp, which is fine because that'll mean pigments will move and I'm using an Indian yellow, which is um, when it is at full strength, it's very much an orange and a little bit of an orange actually. And I'm gonna start painting in these cones. And I really love how Windsor and Newton's watercolor paper takes, um, sort of just takes to the pigment, how beautiful and jewel-like these things look. The next thing I'm going to do, you note I'm not filling in the entire cone, I'm just filling in some of it. Next thing I'm going to do, take this spray bottle, if it'll work, I might be switching spray bottles halfway through this tutorial, because when it does work, it puts down too much water. Anyway, I am spraying my blossoms to encourage the paint to sort of move on the paper. See how it, um, let me zoom in for you guys, sort of just spreads out. Now this is something I can't do with my watercolor comics because some of my panels get so small, I can't control that. Now, if you want to, if you feel like you need to, you can, if you get some on the figure, you can dab it away with a paper towel, but I really don't mind. I, I'm doing this to sort of play around with um, pushing and pulling and controlling and leaving things as they are. So I'm gonna let this sort of dry a little bit. It's gonna take a long time because this, is, this paper can hold a lot of water. Um, I'm gonna let this dry for a little bit and then I'll see you guys in a little, in a few minutes. Actually, I might just dab that up just a little bit and maybe some of this pooling over here because I don't really want it to pool. Pooling's gonna make it look muddy and you can dab it up very simply with, you know, a clean paper towel. So you don't really want to encourage pooling, you want to encourage spreading. All right, so my paper has had time to dry. You can see it is still puffed up. So long as I don't remove the tape, it should dry flat. Um, it's still cool to the touch. Um, I waited a little bit longer than I really would have liked uh, to resume painting, grabbing a better brush. Uh, but I think I'm ready to make some more progress. 
so I mixed a naphthol red. In fact, I think I might even want to go direct in some places. And I'm going to spray this naphthol red with my better spray bottle. We'll see if we can't get a better result. And like I said, I want to work pretty quick. That's why you want to work while the paper's still moderately damp. And I am actually going to avoid being too close to the face. I don't mind if I get a little bit in the face, as you can see happened here with some of that Indian yellow, but I don't want it obscuring the face. I'm also not trying to get, you know, fine details down, because like I said, we're going to be spraying this in a minute. Okay. Let's hope this spray bottle has a finer mist. Try and encourage that water to go up. Basically, I just want it to look like um, I didn't use direct uh, brush strokes. So I'm going to go ahead, wipe up that excess water and pigment. And if there's any pooling, I just want to dab it up like I showed you guys. And I also want to reintroduce that white highlight. Do this by kind of folding my paper towel up nice and fine and just dabbing it here and there and the paper is going to basically suck in the water again because water tends to move from areas of saturation to less saturation so um, it'll sort of fill it in but hopefully it'll be less intense all right I'm liking how this is turning out so far though. I'd like it if some of the naphtha red, naphthal red entered the cone flowers a little bit more, the actual cones of the flowers, but I can encourage that um, a little bit later on after this is sort of dried. Might even go in and do this flower again since it didn't seem to really get the spray either. See, the thing is I don't want to saturate the paper so too too much because if it's too wet you're not going to get good movement it's just going to become you know a messy puddle there we go all right so i'm going to let this dry and check in with you guys all right guys it's had some time to dry so i'm going to do another layer with that red and I want the red to go up into the cone of the flower now. So I'm putting just a little bit at the base because it's gonna spread out a whole lot. And I'm trying to work quick because I don't want, not that, I mean the paper's still pretty wet so that shouldn't be an issue. And it's actually raining outside and has been most of the afternoon. So, <laughs> you know, if any day was a day to do a technique like this that kind of relies on the paper staying wet until you can spray it. Today would be a pretty good day for that. I'm trying to apply it pretty thickly. And then it just pathetically drops. All right. Now, something else I can do is I can introduce some more of that red and it'll disperse. And it really just takes a couple of drops. All right, well, I think you guys know the drill now. We gotta let it wait. Uh, gee. We have to let it dry, so that means we gotta wait. So we've got these areas where the water has sort of pushed out some of the pigment. So what I'm going to do, since it's still wet, I'm just gonna add a little more back. Hopefully I won't regret this too much. Again, time to let this dry. All right, guys, so this is pretty much dry, and I want to add some of that um, Indian yellow back into the cone flowers. And let's try a third spray bottle. Looks like uh, that ought to do it. 
So again, let this dry and I'll check back in with you guys. It seems like the theme for this is long dry periods, which is one of the part one of the many reasons why this technique wouldn't really work for me in how I handle seven inch Kara. You might find this technique works well for how you do comics or standalone illustrations though. Hey guys, I'm back, ready to paint again. This is dried completely, it dried overnight. Um, so, uh, <laughs> basically you can see that right now it's very gestural sort of um, hints at what the items could be, could be. I can leave them like this or I can sort of render them with more detail. Um, so what I want to do right now is I want to go ahead and mix up Kara's skin tone. I'll pull out so you guys can see that. I'm going to use a pipette to uh, fill a well in my weld palette with some clean water. I'm also going to put a drop of clean water on my scarlet and on my um, yellow ochre. Those are the two that I typically use for skin tones for her. Um, while those sort of activate, I'm also going to fill a well for her hair. Got it from the wrong cup, but it doesn't really matter all that much. And I usually use Indian red as a base color for her hair. And I'm going to start working on these flowers. And to do that, I want to activate this mauve from Soho. Also wanna activate some green gold and some hooker's green. And most of these are just convenience colors. Uh, they help me with quickly mixing the colors I need for watercolor pages. So I have them handy. They're good colors though, at least the green gold and the hooker's green are good colors if you do landscapes, although hooker's green is not necessarily a green you would find in nature. I like it because I feel like it's a good in the middle between cool greens and warm greens. Cool greens being greens that tend towards blue and warm greens being greens that tend towards yellow. start on these flowers by working on the petals. Brush some color on and then blend some of it out with water. I'll pull it so you guys can see that. This Windsor Newton uh, watercolor paper really takes the paint very well. It's fun to paint with. I really should have started over here if I'd been smart. Would it give me somewhere to rest my hand? Right now I'm finding it easier to work with two brushes rather than to use one and constantly clean it. dry and then I'll come back to you guys and we will continue working on this. So the flowers are dry enough for me to be able to move on and start working on the stems and I'm going to put down a layer of the green gold first. I also noticed a petal I'd missed. 
while the green gold is still wet, I'm gonna take some of that hunter's green. Hopefully it'll blend out a little bit without taking over the whole thing. It's a lot drier today than it was yesterday, so these are drying a lot quicker. But I want it effect more like this than like that necessarily. I could try to blend it out, but I have a feeling that's gonna make it worse. So I'm just going to let it be and see how it looks when it's dry. Next thing I wanna do is I do wanna go back into those cone flowers and add even more orange. Just not orange enough for me. And that's mostly at the top. Then I'm going to take another brush dipped in the, I think that's naphthol red. Work the two together like that. We'll see what, how, how that looks. So I gotta work quick, which is why I've got two brushes out. Because for it to, to soak into the orange, the orange needs to be wet. And it looks like it is overtaking the orange in some places. Let me zoom in for you guys so you can see what's going on. So I'm going to let these dry before I decide whether or not I want to darken them or do anything else with them. I may end up going back over and, you know, popping that orange a little bit more. We'll see how it looks when it's dry. Those flowers have had plenty of time to dry. Um, looking at my stems, they're looking a little bit too green. So I am going to put some water in a pyrrolene blue. I'm also going to go back with the green gold. And on some of these stems, I'm going to put a layer of said green gold on top of the hunter's hooker's green. I'm also going to go in with that naphthol red again. And just sort of squiggle it onto those cones. And if I want to get darker than this, I'm going to either start mixing in indigo or possibly um, a purple. In with my naphthol red to get it even darker. the brush really well and then move into that skin tone I mixed earlier. Now I'm gonna take that purple and just start squiggling it in towards the bottom of the cone. Just as sort of my darkest shadows on the cone flower. painting pretty thickly. Um, with a paper like the Windsor and Newton watercolor paper, the cold press watercolor paper, it has enough tooth um, and it's sturdy enough that painting like this isn't really a problem. With cheaper papers or thinner papers like say Canton Montval, I can't paint this thickly because paint will start to slough off as I apply subsequent layers. could also paint this thickly if I were working on a handmade paper like Shenzhen or um, a cotton rag mold made paper like um, Canson's, no, Arches, there we go. Used to be owned by Canson, not anymore. And I wanna mix my skin tone a little bit um, less translucent, so a little darker, a little more concentrated. 
it's not really standing up to all the purples and oranges, which is fine. Um, that's part of doing this, but if I can get it to stand out a little bit better, that would be good too. Go ahead and use some of that pearline blue with a little bit of indigo. Yeah, it's gonna work out much better. All right, I guess you guys know the drill. Gotta let this dry. Okay, so that's all at least visibly dry. I'm going to go ahead now. Well, actually I'm gonna, yeah, that's dry, okay. So I'm gonna knock in the first layer of hair using, um, you know, a kind of a wash, a watered down version of Indian Red. Now Indian Red is, um, it's a red earth tone, so a red brown, and it's uh, made from natural, like, uh, like organic, not, not organic, but like earth pigments. So, you know, minerals or even dirt. <laughs> I actually don't know what exactly goes into Indian Red. Um, the point I'm trying to make, though, is if you work with it at its full strength, it's actually very opaque. It does work okay for washes. You want to be careful how many layers you put on it, how much glazing you do with it, because it can start to get really chalky. On nicer papers, it's less of a problem, but on Canson Montval, it can be a big issue. And I, I keep saying Canson Montval because that's what I use for the carapages, so I'm very familiar with it. I also want to just, oh, that's a little too red. Add a little bit of a tint to her lips. And I'll add that to the cheeks once her hair is dried. All right, so I think the hair has dried. Oh, and that's gonna be too intense. And put a little blush across the cheeks and the bridge of the nose. Go ahead and darken the skin that falls underneath the echinacea and down here as well. I'm gonna have to decide what color I want her little kerchief and her shorts and her shirt to be. I'm still sort of on the fence. I can't decide if I want to go with a contrasting color and sort of pop her out of the background or if I want her to fade into the background so that it's just her face. Now, if I wanted to put contrast just on her face, I would make her kerchief a, a color that really stood out. I might even go with like a yellow to yellow orange to reference those cone flowers and then do the shorts maybe in that naphthol red. But I'm still sort of thinking about it. All right. So, um, the hair has dried, so I'm gonna go ahead and do another layer on this face. And usually, with um, the way I draw, or my style of drawing and coloring, I will, um, for like initial layers, I'll go ahead and block in everything from the tip of the nose on up, especially on more cutesy or younger characters, which Kara definitely fits in that category under the nose, under the lips, the creases at the mouth, and just sort of around the chin. And then in subsequent layers, um, I'll just sort of refine that getting tighter and tighter as I go. I think I'm going to render all of the skin um, and hair before, or most of it at least, before I start with the clothes because um, I'm going to use naphthol red mixed with mauve to shade her skin. Um, and I just want to make sure I don't push it too far into the balance of, you know, the naphthol red. I don't want it to overpower the piece too much. All right, guys, so that layer has dried. It's time for another. And you might decide you want to go ahead and mix your skin tone maybe a little bit darker. I find it can be hard to control that way. So um, <laughs> I usually either work with swatches or uh, just sort of let mother nature 
take its course and uh, allow my paints to evaporate or I very slowly build up the tones I want. Now the, the last method, um, you do run the risk of things getting kind of muddy because you're just not building enough, up enough contrast. You can also mix your paints a little thicker and then, you know, use a side palette or a craft uh, mat or, a, you know, something non-stick to uh, sort of dilute your colors as you need them diluted. That's a good way to sort of keep the colors you want without um, them becoming too, too intense or too muddy. And I'm gonna go ahead and start mixing that shadow tone. Or at least maybe, you know, I really don't want too much water in it. So some of that naphthol red. Oh, you guys can't see what I'm doing. Some moth. And now to let the skin dry. So that layer is dry, it looks like. I'm going to mix my Indian red just a little bit darker. I want to get all the pigments out of the brush and dip it in fresh. Time to do her little freckles. Actually, wouldn't it be smart if I zoomed really in? And I like to do a couple of layers when I do freckles because they do dry lighter than they go down. Um, and real freckles, you know, you're gonna have some that are faded, bleh, some that are faded and some that are fresh. Some on the legs. That Indian red even deeper. Go in, leaving like a little crescent moon as a highlight. Unfortunately, my long handled brush hits the camera when it's down like this. So I have to work carefully. So you all know the drill, gotta let that dry. All right, so the hair is dry. And just further refining it. And in order to get these sort of sharp reflection lines, you need to wait until the paint is dry. And for hair, you wanna work with a brush that has good snap to it. That way you can pull those sort of sharper details. I'm handshaking pretty bad today. And I'm gonna also go ahead and darken up Using a mixture of uh, pureline blue and indigo, some of those stems. And before things get too far along, I'm going to mix up some Indian yellow and just sort of splatter it here in some of those open areas. And if I want a larger splatter, A, I should mask that off her face because I don't want it all over her face. And mix up that Indian yellow, very wet and kind of loose. whether or not I want to spray that or just leave it. Clean up some of my errant yellow splatters. You can get a better splatter effect if you use a toothbrush and you run a finger or um, like a tongue depressor or something against the bristles, but I don't have one handy. 
so I'm not going to worry about it. All right, guys, now it's time to start shading the skin using that mixture of naphthol red and mauve. And I'm going to be pretty light handed, pretty much just shading the skin where shadows would be cast. And I think, hmm, I think I'm still gonna have to think about what color to make her kerchief, her shirt, and her shorts. All right, guys, I'm gonna do something I might regret. I kind of want to blend some of this out. So I'm gonna mask over her face, pull the camera out, give myself room to work. Just reactivate some of the lower ones. See if those go anywhere. It doesn't really look like they are. I'm not gonna encourage them with a brush to go anywhere. I just, if they were going to sort of spread out, especially the, the purple is kind of um, just a little bit too in one place on some of these. I wish I had been able to blend it out a little bit better. Maybe I can encourage the purple to move a little bit. Just like gently tapping it with a clean, wet brush. It looks like it is actually working. You guys know the drill, gotta let that dry. All right guys, I've given this plenty of time to dry. Also given it plenty of time to think. And I think I'm actually gonna go with Indigo for her shorts. And this is sort of a bluish, well, it's more of a greenish Indigo, what, who am I kidding? Off camera, I'm mixing plenty of indigo on my brush, removing a stray cat hair. Looking a little darker than I really want. So what I'm gonna do is apply color to all three areas, take a smaller brush, dip it in water, and spread that color around a little bit, and try to be quick. Oh, this will dry a little bit lighter than it's going down. But if we apply it too dark, from the start, we'll have nowhere to go. the drill gotta let it dry. The first layer on our shorts has dried so now we can go in with another layer I'm using a smaller brush. One of the downsides of taping your uh, watercolor piece to your craft mat is if your craft mat isn't sturdy and this is this is a very flexible craft mat it's more like a cookie sheet kind of silicon baking mat sort of thing. Um, not that that's what it is, but it's like that. Um, if you have a non-sturdy craft mat and you tape your watercolor to that, it's, if it does buckle, it'll take the mat with it. Right now I have some minor rocking issues. All right, y'all know the drill, gotta let it dry. All right, so that layer's dry, and I kind of don't want to go too much darker because uh, it's already pretty dark as it is. I'm just going to, I think, fill in the areas that are absolutely shadow. And while I have this blue out, Maybe darken the shadow underneath some of the flowers. Now for her her kerchief, remember how we talked about um, maybe doing like a yellow with some orange shading? 
that's what I'm going to do. So I am activating a cadmium yellow right now. And I need to give that a few minutes to soak in, let the pigments work their magic. All right, that yellow has had time to become activated. Though it looks a little dirty, I might not actually use it. Now, a little bit of that Indian yellow. And I'm working that in while the um, cadmium yellow is still wet. That way it will sort of blend. In fact, while I've got it, add it a little bit to some of the flowers. So something that's bothering me just a little bit is that the shorts over here, they're very distinct. They don't really blend in with the picture. So I'm going to take some of my clean water, apply it right next to it, and then activate this area just a little bit to encourage a little bit of bleed. Because I don't want to spray, I don't want to make mud. I do want the blue to sort of interplay with everything else a little bit. And I'll do that on the other side as well. In fact, I'll zoom in on the other side. And hopefully it'll make the shorts look more like they belong in the picture instead of just something I just, you know, sort of arbitrarily put in. Not that I did, but you get, yeah, I think you guys get what I'm saying. And I'm gonna do the same thing over here with the yellow, although that's less of an issue. Activate some of those drops too. All right, you guys know the drill, gotta let it dry. Looking at it, I also think I need to mix in some of that, excuse me, gee, that naphthol red and mauve. So, I'm gonna take some off of my palette. Get it nice and activated and just sort of blend it in. I almost wish I could spray it, but I know spraying it would oh, would reactivate way too many things and would just make a big mess. I think though that's going to work out really well. It's going to help balance. Um, I probably do need some yellow or some more yellow over there though. Or maybe even some right there. Trying to have a very light hand. So I don't want to reactivate everything. I just want to mix in a little bit. So it's been about 30 minutes. Paper has had significant, sufficient, not significant, sufficient time to dry. Sorry about bumping the camera. All right, I'm gonna add some of that. The same color I use to shade the skin, which is a mauve and naphtha red mixed together. And I need to, I need something for her shirt. And I'm glad I did that bleed out. I don't wanna do, maybe I will do, start with Indian yellow and we'll go to orange, I think. And we'll do that bleed technique. And I think you guys know the drill, let that dry. All right. All right, so I am activating a very intense orange by dropping a little bit of paint on it. And I think I'm going to start to finish her hair. 
So I'm taking some Van Dyke Brown. And by now my orange should be activated. Mix that in with that Indian yellow. All right. Looks like it's time to let it dry yet again. Where we're getting to the almost finished part and on these little bitty illustrations like this, it becomes um, really, there's a lot of paint one little thing, wait 20 minutes, paint one little thing, wait 20 minutes. Fortunately, it's a boiling hot, dry day outside. So everything is drying pretty quick for me. Kinda glad I started this last night when it was like raining because it gave me lots of open time where the paint was sitting on top of the paper. So there's one last thing in watercolor that I want to do on this and that is add some shade over here to that orange using the same mixture I used on her uh, kerchief and on her skin. I'm also going to go back in, always nitpicking, uh, go back in on her shorts and just put those details back just a little bit where they sort of got blended out. I did that on purpose because I wanted them to better fit in with the scenery. All right, so next I'm going to be pulling out some... Uh, my white opaque kit, I've gone over that before, but this has to fully dry before you can do that. At least give it an hour. You really don't want to go into it while it's still wet because the paper is going to be mushy and your pencils are going to tear it up. All right, guys, so my watercolor has had plenty of time to dry. So now I am switching over to a tiny stub of a Derwin Intense in Intense White. This is an opaque white. I'm gonna start adding a few preliminary details with this and then I may switch over to white gouache. Nice thing about this is if I want to, I can blend it out, but I sort of want to take advantage of the paper texture and uh, leave some sort of color pencil -y marks. Also, I've had problems with my um, paints sort of reactivating as I add layers. And I don't want to add too, too much white because I left some white to begin with. And um, outside of my comics, we're leaving, we're adding white back in as sort of a necessity of the medium I'm working with and the time constraints I'm working with. I left um, a fair amount of white in the paper, so I don't really wanna distract or detract away from that. I really just wanna add some contrast. Unfortunately, most uh, easily available white, um, sort of like antique white or um, Derwent's color soft white, those all tend to be bluish whites. Um, if you guys can recommend not a yellow, maybe I should be using a cream, but I really just want a white that tends toward a redder hue. And I want to use just a little bit of white gouache. And this is titanium, right? I think it's, no, permanent white. And titanium buff might be a better option for what I'm looking for. Oh, that got watery. It's going down a little heavier than I wanted. And you can blend out gouache as well. You can get some of it down on here and then I'll do that. All right, need to let that dry again. All right, so I wanna go back in and add some more dark brown to her hair since it got 
kind of lightened up too much. But I think once that paint, oh shoot, once that paint dries, we'll pretty much be done. I keep putting my hand in the gouache. So I'll see you guys in a few minutes when this is dry. All right guys, so my piece is finally dry. We're finished, I know, right? It took forever. I felt like I, I told you guys to hold on, I'd be back in a bit, like eight times. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the masking tape. And you wanna do it at a 90 degree angle away from your piece. That way if it tears, it doesn't tear into uh, your live watercolors. And I found that masking tape um, tends to destroy my paper way less than say um, watercolor artist tape, which is apparently intended to be cut away, leaving just the painted area, which is all well and good, but. <laughs> You know, that doesn't really work for me, so I use masking tape. Anyway, this is the finished piece. I think it's pretty cute. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. Thank you guys um, for keeping me company. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below. If there's any any technique you'd like to, me, like to see me go over in detail in its own video, please let me know that as well. Um, <laughs> I hope I inspired you. I hope I gave you some ideas. I hope this is a technique you'll try in your own illustration. It's a lot of fun. I really like how um, it just feels watercolory. I know that sounds really kind of stupid, but I mean, it's got like a bit of randomness to it. You know, the bleeds aren't just perfectly even. When I do the Kara pages, they're so rendered out, I lose a lot of the spontaneity. So it's a lot of fun to do pieces like this, and it's a lot of fun to hang out with you guys. Um, so since we're at the end of the video, it's time for the old song and dance. If you guys enjoyed this tutorial and you want more like it, please hit subscribe, right? here, not where I'm actually pointing, but at that point in time, uh, to subscribe to my channel for more goodness like this. Um, if you just can't get enough, I would really appreciate it if you checked out my blog at natosoup.blogspot.com. I'll post the process photos there in case there was a stage you just want to revisit. Maybe it spoke to you. Sometimes the process stages speak more to me than the finished piece. I don't really know why. Um, if you guys want to help me out like a real, real solid, please, 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 if you enjoyed this video or any of my videos or my channel, take a moment to share it to your social networks. Tell your friends, let them know. Be proud that this helped you out because that would help me out immensely. I get a lot of private messages and private emails thanking me for some of the stuff I, I do and I appreciate that. Totally not dissing that, but it would help me out super duper much if you hit those social buttons to Facebook, to Twitter, to Tumblr, to Pinterest, anywhere you are, and let your friends know that you like this video. Your good word means more to your friends than anything I could say. Maybe they'll find out they like it too. That would help me out immensely. I would be in your debt. The last way you can help me out is financially, and you can find out how on patreon.com slash natosoup. Uh, there's more than just helping to fund goodies like this. Um, you also get some pretty sweet backer rewards, and I'm currently brainstorming new exciting things to offer you guys, so that is always an option. I'm Becca Hilburn. Thank you so much for hanging out in my studio. Um, I hope to see you guys again real soon. Bye!